Good afternoon. I started the recording right now. And welcome to the Ethical Implication of AI series of lectures. My name is Roberto Zicari. And I'm pretty uh, happy that we have uh, several qualified speakers in our series. The uh, first lecture yesterday was an overview covering a number of topics that will be discussed more in detail during the next lectures. I'm uh, pretty happy to have as a first guest, second lecture, Dr. Emmanuel Goffi, Director Observatory on Ethics and Artificial Intelligence at the Institute Sapiens. And without any further delay, let me give the word to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, the floor is on you. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, so welcome to all of you to this lecture on the ethics of artificial intelligence. Um, I first want to thank uh, Professor Zicardi for having me on board. I'm really grateful to him that he offered me this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts about uh, ethics of artificial intelligence today. And obviously uh, also on April 30, uh, when we will when I will present on ethics, moral values, humankind, technology, and AI examples. So um, I'm Emmanuel Goffi. I'm the director of the newly uh, established Observatory on Ethics and Artificial Intelligence in Paris, the Institut Sapiens. And uh, we'll try to see during the, let's say, next two hours, what a AI ethics is and how it can be uh, tackled or assessed. The first thing I want to tell you is that obviously during this presentation, I do not pretend uh, holding any kind of truth. So uh, everything that I will tell you is disputable, must be disputed even, is questionable. The only thing is that I will try to provide you with some grounds on which you will be able to build your own opinion uh, by looking or searching other perspectives and, and by uh, using other sources, obviously, okay? So basically, there is what we will do during this uh, two hours. The course will be split into two parts. The first one will be really basic, trying to understand what is ethics. And you will see that it's not really easy. And obviously, once again, what I will tell you about the definition of ethics, the tentative definition of ethics that I will provide you with, is disputable and uh, maybe you will have different perspectives. Maybe some of you already have a definition or a clear idea of what ethics is. But uh, I do think that this part will just give to those of you who do not have any background in philosophy, uh, some interesting point that you will be able to use in your own uh, ethical assessment. The second part will be uh, specifically on artificial intelligence. That was the uh, most difficult part to prepare because there are many, many things, too much things to tackle, to assess, and to discuss on, on uh, ethics and artificial intelligence. So uh, we'll try to have a basic understanding of the relation between ethics and artificial intelligence. So those two parts will last something like 90 minutes. And at the very end, we'll have some room for Q&A, let's say 20, uh, 30 minutes. At the end of part one, I will take two to three uh, questions uh, just to uh, have kind of a break between the two big parts. So let's start where actually Professor Zikari left us yesterday, uh, uh, which is the definition of ethics. And I will use his own quote, uh, which is was drawn from an interview he's made with Pedro Domingos. And this quote goes like this. So maybe AI will force us to confront what we really mean by ethics before we can decide how we want to, we want AIs to be ethical. That's something really important because um, as you certainly know it, you've certainly read and heard lots of things about AI ethics, but most of those things are not truly really about ethics. They're just opinions. They're just common sense opinions given by people that do not have any kind of background on ethics. So I would definitely advise you to be um, uh, really cautious on what you read, what kind of sources you use, and what kind of people you quote, knowing that 
if you really want to make a thorough assessment of uh, AI in terms of ethics, you will need to know what ethics is. I've heard too many times that ethics is about politics, that ethics is common sense, that ethics is to some extent like law, uh, which is not true, right? So just be aware that ethics is kind of a buzzword that is overused today. So if it's just about chit-chatting with friends, uh, obviously you can use everything that you heard and read, but if you really want to work thoroughly on, on, on ethics, you will have to go beyond that and you will have to sort uh, all the, uh, the information that you, will, that you will use. So what is ethics? Um, let's think, let's assume that some of you do not have any idea of, of what ethics is exactly. So we'll start from the very beginning. And the first thing I want to stress, because I think it's really, really important, is that ethics is a branch of philosophy. Uh, it's a branch of philosophy along with logic, metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, and political philosophy. Uh, what does that mean? That means that if you don't have any kind of background in philosophy, you will not be able to make an ethical assessment of anything, AI uh, in the case uh, we are dealing with here. But I would say that no one would ever try to solve an equation without the basic requirements in mathematics, right? So why would we uh, pretend to uh, solve ethical question without uh, the basic requirements in philosophy? Uh, so it's a branch of philosophy, meaning that you cannot just use the word ethics, saying this is ethics or this is unethical, without knowing exactly what is hidden behind those two words. As a branch of philosophy, ethics deal with right and wrong. And ethics is basically an appraisal of right and wrong. What is right and wrong? What is desirable? What is not? What is acceptable and what is not? Uh, we often use this, you know, dichotomy between uh, good and bad, what is good and what is bad. And the first thing that you certainly see yeah, in, in, in this, not definition, but it's explanation of, of what uh, ethics is, is that um, defining what good and bad mean is really complex, uh, if not totally impossible. Defining what is right and what is wrong is totally impossible, except if you try to define them in a uh, specific environment, specific context. So for think right and wrong must always be appraised in a specific context. We'll see later that uh, some people would say that um, there are some universal values on which we can build universal perspective on the right and wrong but uh, we'll see the limit of this kind of, uh, of stance. Then right and wrong must be appraised regarding a specific uh, context. And I will go deeper on that later. Uh, I would even say in a specific moral context, and you will understand why. Then the third point I wanted to stress is that ethics is an assessment of human actions. Uh, you've certainly read uh, or heard here and there that uh, maybe AI is not ethical or maybe drones are unethical tools. Um, this is really misleading. Actually, drones or AI or any kind of tool that is used uh, is ethically neutral. Uh, it's only the use of them that would be, that could be actually assessed uh, at the ethical level. So meaning that if you, let's say, take um, a plane, uh, you would ask, are planes ethical or not? That would be really tough to answer that question. Obviously, if you use those planes to crash into buildings like uh, it has been done during September 11, you can consider that planes are unethical. But if you consider that planes can be used to save people, to, uh, uh, to bring them back home, like in the current uh, situation with the COVID, uh, Obviously, you can say that planes are ethical, right? But at the very end of the day, it's not about planes, it's not about the tool, it's about how they've been used. So when you assess AI, you always have to keep in mind that um, if you want to be really rigorous in your assessment, you will have to appraise the 
use of it by people that are using obviously AI. So it's about human action and that's something really important. Why is that about human action? Uh, mainly I would say because ethics is basically um, the evaluation of a decision that you make regarding your behaviors toward others. So this is something you can find in uh, lots of theories. We'll see them uh, a little bit later uh, in Aristotle, virtue ethics, but also in Kantianism and consequentialism. This idea that ethics is about the relation we have with uh, other is really important. So this is a relation, really a relation. And ethics is kind of mediator between uh, you myself, the ethos on the left uh, hand side of the screen, and the others, the pathos on the right hand side of the screen. And what we're trying to do when we meet with people is to keep a balanced distance between the self and others, between ethos and pathos. When we meet with people, basically we can consider them as either friends or foes. Uh, if you don't want to fall into the trap of considering everyone as a foe, as a potential enemy, obviously you will have to use what we call virtues. And those virtues, a number of four virtues that have been developed, the four cardinal virtues developed by Plato and further used by other philosophers, those virtues will definitely help you to keep the balance between you and others and keep a, you know, correct distance between you and others. Not considering them as always foes and not considering them as always friends, right? Just having this kind of neutral relation with other people. And so um, if you read French, uh, you, can, you can refer to the, uh, uh, to the document that is, uh, that is indicated on, on the slide, uh, Michel Meyer, and uh, is, is just doing this really interesting work explaining how those four virtues are helping us to keep the balance between us and others, right? To keep this distance between us and others. So basically ethics is a relation. It's all about a relation. And I would even say it's a relation under a specific condition, as I mentioned previously, uh, a certain condition of moral constraints. And we'll go back to that to make the difference between ethics and morality. So ethics is about your behavior towards others in a specific moral environment. So regarding this difference between ethics and uh, morality, you can obviously use them interchangeably. That's not a problem. And, and most of the time, those two words are used without making any difference. Uh, if you look at the uh, etymology of those words, obviously one uh, morality is coming from the Latin word mores, which is about habits and, and customs. And if you take ethics, it's the same word, but in Greek, that's about uh, also ethos, uh, it, which is the habits of, of, of individuals. So you can either consider that those two words are um, the same and don't make a difference. But what I would propose you is to uh, use a different perspective and to make a difference between uh, morality and ethics. Uh, once again, it's disputable. You're not obliged to, uh, to approve that or, or to accept that or even to adopt this proposition. But I think it makes things clearer when it comes to um, discussing uh, ethics. So what I do is I use uh, Paul Ricoeur's uh, reflection on ethics and morality. Uh, the first thing Paul Ricoeur tells us in his book, which is oneself like another, is that ethics has the primacy over morality. He thinks that the focus must be put on ethics, and you will understand why. Uh, morality are general rules, while ethics is a specific uh, application of those rules in, in a given context at a given time. So it, it does consider that ethics is much more important than morality. Then it defines the aim of ethics uh, through three different terms. The first one is aiming at good life, which is basically what Aristotle told us about ethics. 
uh, this is basically also what in sequentialist would tell, tell us about happiness, right? The pursuit of happiness. So for Paul Ricoeur, this idea of aiming at good life is at the core of ethics. We are all looking for a good life. We are all trying to reach this point where we're happy in our life. Obviously, that uh, raised the question of what a good life is. Uh, I have a I mean, clear idea of what a good life would be for me, for maybe my, uh, my family and my, some of my friends, uh, but I cannot, I cannot pretend that I know what a good life is for the whole world. I don't know what a good life is for people in Africa. I don't know what a good life is for people in Latin America. I don't even know what a good life is for people in Northern America. So um, that's the first point here is when you say aiming at a good life, what does that mean exactly? Is it really specific or can you extend that to the whole world? The second term is it aims at good life with and for others. Here we find again this idea that ethics is a relation with others. And obviously uh, Ricoeur is an interactionist, is really focused on interactions between people. Uh, the stance being that uh, what we are, our identity, uh, which leads to specific behaviors, is shaped by the relation we have with others, with the people we meet, with the environment, right? So there is and there are interactions between us and others, and through those interactions, we will build our own personality, what we are. So ethics is obviously a relation with uh, others and for others in the sense of, we'll see that also, uh, that we might have, for Ricoeur and some other philosophers, a responsibility toward others. So it's not only how I behave regarding my own values, it's also about how I behave regarding the expectation of others. Right, so have this, this responsibility with and for others. And the last point is within just institutions. So institutions here must be understood at large as all the rules that are framing our uh, daily behaviors in a specific community. It's not uh, something that is related to, um, I mean, uh, an established institution like a uh, government institution or these kind of things, but it's mostly about the set of rules that are applicable to me and to the community I, I belong to at a certain time, right? So once again, it relates us to what I was saying before, which is ethics is a relation between people within a specific moral context. So those institutions are the moral rules that are applicable. And then the last point, which is I think the most important about uh, Paul Ricoeur's work is that it makes a difference between ethics and morality. And actually he split that in three parts. I would just go first with the, um, the morality that you have here, obviously, which is the set of rules that are applicable to a specific population, specific community at a specific time in a specific uh, uh, geographic environment. Morality are rules that you have to follow because they've been built like that. Let's say, for example, moral rules are you shall not kill something that you will find in the Bible. Uh, so you will not kill or, or maybe you will not do harm to others. So these are the kind of rules that are basically applicable. On each side of morality, you have first, before morality, what he calls inferior ethics or meta-ethics. And meta-ethics is related to the definition I just gave you before, the definition of Ricoeur's I gave you before. And it's all about the um, study of how those moral rules have been set, how they've been created, right? Considering that the basic aim of ethics is to aim at good life, reason for others, within just institution. How did we build in a specific environment those moral rules? So ethics is the study of the setting up of those uh, moral rules. And on the other side, what we call, what he calls posterior ethics is also um, uh, called the application of ethics, right? Uh, in, in your everyday life is how you will 
apply those moral rules in really specific uh, situation. So it's practical ethics. On one side, you have the study of ethics, then you have the moral rules that have been built, and then there is how you will apply those moral rules in a specific situation, right? So that's all interesting because if you hear about, for example, the morality of AI, that doesn't make any sense uh, here with this definition, right? There is no moral rule saying anything about AI, right? There are more rules about the fact that you don't need to, that you don't, you must not, sorry, uh, harm people, that you must respect some fundamental rights, obviously, but it's not specific to AI, right? AI is a res really specific topic that is tackled by ethics. Uh, and I mean this kind of poster ethics that uh, Ricker is talking about. So just keep that as the basic definition, as the basic way we will see the difference between ethics and morality uh, during this presentation. But once again, it's up to you to uh, accept that, discuss that, or reject it. So the risk here is that if you don't have this kind of reflection about what is ethics, uh, when it will come to make ethical assessment of AI, um, you, the risk is to fall into the trap of what I call cosmetics. And cosmetics is, is uh, a way to use ethics in a way that is not philosophical. Uh, it's something that is uh, quite common uh, if you uh, listen to the news, if you read newspapers and, and magazine. Uh, article, you will see that ethics is overused. I've, I've recently uh, read a report in which uh, the word ethics, there, were, there was 24 pages in this report, and ethics is used uh, most, more than, than 100 times without any kind of ethical analysis, just saying this is ethical, this is not, this is about ethics, this is not about ethics without defining what ethics means in the specific context of the, uh, the report. So this is the risk of cosmetics. And cosmetics is overused because it's a tool that is used to make things a bit more appealing. When you want to legitimate an action, when you want to legitimate the use of a specific tool, such as, let's say, and we'll discuss that later, uh, autonomous weapons, you will build what we call a narrative about the ethicality of those of these tools um, of your action, right? And you will explain to people that what you're doing is ethical without further explanation about what you mean exactly by ethical. The interesting point is that ethics is a word that speaks to everyone. We all think we know what ethics is. We all think that when it comes to ethics, we are able to make the difference between right and wrong, but in the real world, uh, it's not that easy. So with cosmetics, ethics has been diverted from its original object, which is, once again, philosophy and the appraisal of the right, uh, rightness or wrongness of a specific action. It's mostly used today uh, in communication as a rhetorical tool, right? Just to legitimate, justify uh, things that we are doing. Okay, let's say uh, we'll discuss that too. Uh, tracking apps for COVID-19. Obviously, there is a lot of discussion of discourses, speeches, and declarations stating that uh, this kind of application would be really beneficial for the whole world because it will help to reduce the number of victims of the COVID-19. Uh, that's a rhetorical, rhetorical tool because people would say, look, it's really ethical to uh, try to help people and save lives. Uh, but we'll see that it's, it's a bit more complex than just that. So it's used by political leaders as well uh, when it comes, for example, for military intervention. You know, we'll try to legitimate it, saying that it's ethical because it's the purpose of this military intervention is to fight against terrorism, let's say, or to uh, uh, help in a, uh, uh, in a country that we're, we're uh, human rights are violated. So you can say that's a humanitarian intervention. And people will think that, well, that's humanitarian. So um, the goal is, uh, is worth it. And then it's ethical. It's been said, so it's acceptable. And they will not think about further. The other point with cosmetics is that uh, maybe for some of you that are aware of these issues about ethics and AI is that 
the debate has been uh, polarized between right and wrong. And most of the time, a lot of people are talking about AI as something that is desirable or that is not, that is right or that is wrong. Uh, people are in favor or against, people are pessimistic or optimistic about AI, right? Uh, the reality is that when it comes to AI, as when it comes to any other topic uh, related or, or assessed by ethics, is that there is a third way. And this third way is much more interesting for us as academics. Uh, this third way is somewhere in between right and wrong. Uh, you certainly know that some things that are right can be at the same time wrong uh, in some aspect and the other way around. Uh, so if you only see the world through the prism of right and wrong, which is called Manichaeism, uh, you will not see all the nuances of ethics and you will not be able to understand the, your environment. You just adopt a stance, you polarize the debate, and you will fight with people that do not agree with you that have the opposite stance, right? And that kills the debate. That really kills the debate. That's all about cosmetics. You will say things are ethical or things are not. Things are morally acceptable or things are not. And you just avoid the most important thing, which is the uh, in-between stance uh, about, about ethics. So cosmetics is aiming mostly at inspiring trust, at making things more appealing than they are. So let's move to um, three theories that are really important. We'll not dive deep into philosophy. Uh, we don't have time and that's not the point with this presentation, but uh, you really need to know that there are basically three theories that are used to assess um, ethical situation. Uh, the first one is, and we'll see them uh, just after that, uh, the first one is virtue ethics that has been developed by Aristotle and especially in his book, uh, The Nicomachean Ethics. And basically the question that is asked by Aristotle is, what kind of person should I be? Uh, what kind of person do I want to be? And this is obviously related to others. It's not what kind of person should I be just myself, isolated on an island. It's what kind of person should I be within my uh, social, so, social environment? What kind of person, what kind of issue do I have to develop or, or use uh, with others? The second, uh, which is certainly the most used theory, is the ontology. It's been developed by Immanuel Kant uh, in the uh, 18th century. And the question asked by Immanuel Kant is, how should I behave? Uh, what kind of action is acceptable and what kind of action is not? And once again, it's in relation with others. Uh, it also entails a responsibility towards others. So the question is, okay, there are things that are acceptable that I can do, and there are things that I cannot do. The ontology is a very complex philosophy and uh, it's quite often used in a very superficial, superficial way. Uh, basically, people would say that, uh, for example, that we have to set code of conducts, right? And that would be the ontology. It's codes of the ontology that are used in some professions, right? Uh, but the ontology is not only about uh, applying codes and rules that have been set by others, right? It's much more complex than that, and we'll see it. And the third theory is called consequentialism. Uh, it's been developed first by Francis Hutchison in the uh, late 17th century, and then by Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, uh, with some differences of perspective on what consequentialism is. But basically the question is, what goal should I reach? So you can see that there are three different perspectives here. The first one is about myself and the, my behavior toward others and the kind of person I am. The other is what kind of rules should I follow in my relation with others? And the other one, the last one is what kind of aim am I uh, trying to reach? So most of the time, 
we are using those three theories in our ethical assessment uh, at the same time. Obviously, when you make an ethical appraisal of a situation, your personality, your virtue, your values will be uh, used uh, in the appraisal, right? Uh, the ontology, there are roles, moral roles, back to Ricoeur's work, morals that are applicable in a specific situation. You will take them into account, even unknowingly, you will take them into account. And obviously, you will think about the consequences of your action. So it's really hard to separate those three uh, theories. When you have to make an appraisal, obviously, you can just assess or evaluate a situation using one of the three theories. But I would say that quite often, if not always, we are using uh, more or less the three uh, theories at the same time. So if you, if we, if we uh, dig into those three theories, once again, we will not do philosophy, and we look at Aristotle, for example, a virtue theory. It's what we call uh, teleological ethics, meaning that there is a final goal for ethics, which is related to what we've said about Ricoeur. Uh, and this ethics that has been developed by Aristotle, Aristotle is mainly aiming at happiness, eudaimonia uh, for the, the Greek word. And we are all trying to live all together uh, in a stable situation and, and just trying to develop happiness, to be happy um, uh, with each other. So this ethics is mainly aiming at uh, happiness. And in order to reach happiness, what Aristotle tells us is that we have to develop virtues. There are virtues that you have uh, naturally, and there are virtues that you can uh, work on, that you can develop, that you can improve. And if you are able to improve those virtues, then you will obviously uh, reach this, uh, this happiness. The most interesting thing that has been developed by Aristotle is what we call the middle ground uh, principle about uh, virtues. So let's take one example. Uh, obviously, uh, courage is a virtue. Uh, it's one of the uh, four cardinal virtues. And what Aristotle tells us is that we have to build on courage. That's really important. Once again, you have to put that back into context, right? At that time, there were wars in the Greek uh, peninsula. And courage was kind of a martial virtue that was really uh, valued at that time. But what Aristotle tells us is that uh, being courageous is just the middle ground between a lack of courage and an excess of courage. Uh, what it brings into debate is the definition of what, what virtues are. We'll, we'll certainly discuss that uh, on April, uh, April 30. But the point here is to say uh, that there is always a middle ground between an excess and a lack of, of something. So virtue ethics is not that used in AI. Uh, you will use it personally when you will ask things, but you will not see that much work on the use of virtue ethics uh, because it would uh, mean that you will focus on, on a specific person developing a specific tool or using a specific tool in AI. So it's not that much interesting. And we can, we can move to the uh, second one, which is, uh, I think, much more used. In the, uh, in the AI field, which is the ontology. Uh, once again, the ontology is basically about the norms, the rules that you have to apply in a specific uh, uh, community at a specific time. But the ontology, as, as, was, uh, as I was saying, is not only about uh, the norms that are applicable to you and that you have to follow. It's, it's much more complex than that. Uh, obviously, if you really want to uh, dive into the philosophy, you will have to read uh, the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals uh, by Manuel Kant, which is, if you're not really keen on philosophy, quite boring. That can be really, you know, uh, dry. But basically, what you have to know is that Emmanuel Kant does not think that if you just follow rules, what you will do will be ethically acceptable. That's not as easy as that. What he says is that 
ethical actions are based on what we call the principle of volition, meaning that if you make a decision to act in such or such well, or that way, uh, you have to do it according to your own will. And the own will is uh, the pure will. I mean, it's the will that you have independently on the influences of your environment. And obviously that's something that is quite impossible. We've seen that our personality, our identity, and our behaviors are shaped by the interactions that we have with others. But what can tell us is if you make an action under the influence of others, that doesn't mean that this action will be acceptable, ethically speaking. It is only if you do this action, you make this action uh, regarding your own will, your personal will, which is called uh, the volition. The second point is that ethical action, according to Kant, are the one that will follow what he calls the categorical imperative. Uh, which goes like that, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. So the point is, you cannot only hack, let's say that um, you, you want to do something, you want to, um, to, to make a specific action. You cannot only say, okay, I'm doing it, so it's ethical because I want it, because I do want it without taking into account the influences of my environment. I just want that, right? I want to, uh, let's say, save the world without any influences. That, make, that does not make your act ethical. What makes it, makes it ethical is if your will can be universalized. And I will give you an example, a clear example of that, which has been developed by Immanuel Kant. Uh, there is a debate between him, uh, so you know that Immanuel Kant is German, and, uh, and, and the French philosopher called Benjamin Constant, and which is about uh, the right to lie. So Immanuel Kant, as a deontologist, uh, the father of deontology, would say, um, we all have a duty to say the truth all the time, whatever the consequences, whatever the situation, we have this duty to tell the truth to all the people around us, whatever, whatever happens. So this is a categorical imperative. And if you go through the imperative, uh, the logic that is followed by Immanuel Kant is to say, if you start lying, even from time to time, uh, what will happen is that the society in which you will live uh, will be led toward mistrust because you will not be able to know who you can trust and who you cannot trust. So his point is to say, if everyone tells the truth, then you know that you can trust everyone, right? So relation between people will be easier. So once again, we, we find this idea that Ethics is, uh, is about the relation we have with others. At the other, at the, on the opposite, uh, the opposite, uh, Benjamin Constant is saying that actually there are some instances where telling the truth is not relevant and that people, there are people in the world that do not actually deserve truth. And there is this example saying that, uh, let's say that you're in the uh, Second World War and someone is trying to escape the Gestapo and uh, uh, this person just knock at your door and just hide in your house. And uh, a bit later, an officer of the Gestapo is, is coming to your place and asking you if you've seen someone they're looking for. Uh, so if you uh, follow the deontological uh, perspective, what you would say is, uh, uh, yes, you will tell the truth to this guest officer and you will tell him, okay, there is someone hidden in my kitchen or in my bathroom, uh, right? Without taking into consideration the consequences of what you uh, have just done. Uh, but for uh, Benjamin Constant, uh, actually those people that are the Gestapo, they do not deserve any kind of, of truth. So according to him, you should not tell them the truth. So there is this big debate about how can we universalize 
these uh, as you call stances and the maxims, right? So that's really important to go through the universal law test. When I want something, is it only me? Is it only my, uh, my family, my friends, uh, my country? Or is it something that can be applicable to the whole world? Most of the time, the ontology is seen as something really universal. And uh, lots of what we call the cosmopolitan stance uh, is based on this universality that has been developed by Emmanuel Kant. Another thing I wanted to, um, to stress, but I've already talked about that, is that acting in conformity with duty does not mean that you're acting ethically. Uh, interestingly, I think that can, that can be applicable to the military, right? Uh, if, you, if you follow a code of conduct, saying you have to do this or to do that, you have to, uh, let's say, serve your country, that's not because you're following the rule that you're acting ethically. Okay, for Emmanuel Kant, uh, acting in conformity with duty puts aside your volition. It puts aside what you really want. But if you're acting from duty, thinking that what you're doing is really good because you're willing it, then things are considered as, uh, as ethical. So uh, back to the supposed right to tell lies. Uh, from benevolent motives. You can find lots of documents uh, about that on, on the internet and dig into that. That's only one example of, of this idea of the ontological rules that can be applicable universally or not. But there is a big debate on what the ontology means. Third and last uh, theory I wanted to address here is um, in sequentialism, you can see different faces here, different pictures of people that have uh, developed this uh, idea of consequentialism. Most of the time, um, people would say that uh, Jeremy Bentham is the father of uh, utilitarianism, consequentialism, but um, actually it's uh, Francis Hutchison who the first coined this idea of the maximization of happiness. Uh, consequentialism is about making sure that lots of people, I mean, more of the people will get the more happiness, right? It's a, a satisfaction, try to maximize uh, the satisfaction. So the idea here is to say, when I do something, if I want it to be ethically acceptable, what I have to make sure is that it will lead to the greatest happiness for the greatest number. If you look at John Stuart Mill works, uh, he just developed another perspective on what is called utilitarianism. And uh, his, his perspective is more about, you know, uh, hedonism and, and the final satisfaction of, of pleasures, which is not the case for Francis Hutchison. But basically, an action must lead to the greatest happiness, to the greatest number, in order to be uh, ethical. Some people would say that those consequences, those outcomes that you're looking for, does not, uh, does not depend on, actually does not have any kind of relation with the action that you're, you're doing. Let's go back to the ontology. If you do something that is acceptable, but the consequences are bad, uh, it doesn't matter for the ontologist. Uh, on the opposite way, for consequentialist, if you're doing something that is bad, but that leads to something that will be worth it, that will lead to the greatest happiness, to the greatest number, then that's not a big problem. So lots of people are seeing consequentialism as really Machiavellian, uh, saying that the, uh, the hands justify the means. But that's not exactly true. That's not exactly what is said by uh, consequentialists. And you can find that in the doctrine of double effect. What is said by consequentialists, and this doctrine has been developed by Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, the idea is to say the consequences must be good, must be worth it. And sometimes in order to reach those consequences, you will have to do bad things, right? But the important point is that those bad things that you are doing in order to reach something good, must not be intentional. Yesterday, someone asked this question. 
uh, during uh, Professor Zikari's lecture about what is the role of intention in the ethical appraisal of, of, of situations. And here we can see that intention is really, really important, really fundamental uh, in the consequentialist uh, perspective and especially in the double effect uh, perspective on, on, on ethics. So you can do bad things in order to reach good ones, but you have to make sure that you don't really want the bad things. They're not intentional. They're just things that you have to go through uh, in order to reach something good. And this is something that has been further developed regarding the war uh, by Michael Walter, based on uh, a play by uh, the French, uh, the French uh, philosopher uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, and which is called The Dirty Hands, and which is about doing bad things in order to reach good. And just to illustrate that, I want to uh, tell you about this example, and I would definitely recommend that you watch this uh, documentary directed by Errol Morris, which is about Robert McNamara. Uh, Robert McNamara was the United States Secretary of Defense uh, between 1961 and 1968. And uh, he was also part of the decision of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. And, and during this, this uh, documentary, it discusses the decision of the bombing, right? And he asked this question really interestingly, how much evil must we do in order to do good? And using this uh, dirty hands philosophy, uh, what he says is that we have uh, certain ideals, certain responsibility, but we also have to recognize that at times we will have to engage in evil. The point is to try to minimize it. So that's one example of these dirty ends and this consequentialist perspective on ethics. Quite quickly, I just want to tell you that there are many others Ways to assess uh, ethical situation. Obviously, I've just told you about the three main theories that are used in the Western world, but you will find a lot of ethical stances in other wisdoms, in other countries, other philosophies, etc. Uh, there is another one that is used by uh, that has been developed by Hans Jonas, which is called the imperative of responsibility, uh, which has led to the precaution principle and which is basically aiming at um, dealing with technology and trying not to you know, uh, threaten humanity by an overuse of technology. So if you're interested in that, you can obviously read the book and, and there are lots of reviews that uh, would uh, offer you a good resume of uh, Anne Shawna's perspective. And the second one, which is also interesting, is a feminist perspective on ethics. Uh, which is called the uh, care ethics, ethics of care, that has been developed by Carol Gilligan. Uh, and this is much more about the difference of the um, ethical appraisal of situation between male and females. So you can, uh, you can agree on that or you can uh, disagree with this you know, dichotomy between the uh, feminist and, and, and masculine uh, point of view about ethics, but uh, there are really interesting things that are developed in Carol Gilligan's book about the way women see their relations to others. Once again, that's, that's the, the, the first point I, I stressed with ethics is that it's a relation to others. So according to Carol Gilligan, women have different relations to others than a male can have. Last point, uh, just an illustration of uh, of all that uh, very famous uh, case dilemma, ethical dilemma case that has been developed by Philip Afford in the late 60s. And it's called the runaway tram problem. As you can see on the picture on the left hand side of the, the, the slide, uh, you have a train on a track and at some point you are driving this, uh, this train. And um, the train cannot be stopped. So at some point you have to make a choice between going left and killing one person or going right, killing a second person, uh, uh, five persons, sorry. This case has been developed 
uh, in a very specific situation, which is a work on the problem of abortion. Uh, can we, uh, uh, can we uh, kill a, a fetus in order to save the life of the mother, right? But it has been extended to a many situations to show how it is difficult to make a difference uh, between values, right? When you have to deal with tension between values. So lots of people would at first sight say, okay, I will just go left and I will kill only one person, right? Which is better than, than five. But some people would say, yes, but can we really balance one life against five? Uh, what is the value of a life? Uh, what is the value of five lives? And then you can also ask the question, what if the person that is on the left track, which is alone, is someone from your family? What if this person is someone that is really important, let's say the president of a country? Uh, what if on the right side you have convicts? You have people that have perpetrated murders, for example. Would you have the same uh, point of view? Would you save the life of the five people on the right? Uh, or would you save the person that is alone on the left side, right? So this is the kind of dilemma that we all face all the time. Obviously, this is uh, the extreme uh, example of, this, of the ethical dilemma. But it shows how difficult it is to make uh, a choice when we are facing ethical dilemma when we have tensions between uh, different values. So if I'm a deontologist, I would say that obviously I would save uh, five people and I will kill one. That's easy, that's the, tr that's the, the rule, right? I just try to, uh, to make sure that you will not harm uh, lots of people. If you're a consequentialist, uh, you can say the same, but you will take into consideration the consequence, meaning that if the person that is alone on the left track is someone who is really important, you will value his life over the lives of the five people that are on the right, that are on the right, uh, independently of any consideration of the value of life itself. You just value the consequences of your action. In this kind of situation, that's something really important. There is no good solution. It's just up to you to make a decision. You will act according to moral rules, to your own values, to lots of things that are uh, dependent on your environment, and you will just make an ethical um, decision. So I think that uh, we're done with this part. Uh, you will have at the end of the presentation lots of uh, bibliography, lots of information, documents that you can read if you want to go deeper into that. But now what I propose is that we uh, move to the uh, second point. But before that, if you don't mind, I can take two or three questions about this first part. Thank you, Manuel. So, um, very interesting, thank you. Uh, there's a number of questions here. Um, let me just read one that says, if you buy a product to help people while being unaware that doing so promotes the production of a product that is made through the exploitation of poor people in colonized country. How do you take into account the intentionality in the, uh, in the theory of consequentialism? Um, obviously, when, you, when you're doing uh, some action, um, I would say that the first thing is, if you look, for example, at Anna Arendt work or a lot of interactionist philosophers, they would say that you have a responsibility before uh, deciding upon the action that you will make. Uh, you have the responsibility to make sure that your action will be a good one. You have to, uh, to obviously get information about the ins and outs of your action. Uh, if you're acting without knowing what the consequences are, obviously when we look at your intention, we will not judge you, think that um, your act was unethical. But at the same time, what we would do is to say, okay, were you able, did you have the possibility to dig into um, the, uh, your action, reflecting on what the consequences would be? So it, it really depends on the situation. When you hacked buying something that you don't know has been made uh, violating, for example, human rights, and I guess we're, we're talking about uh, those firms that are using people in, in poor countries in order to, uh, to, to build good that we buy here in the Western world, 
uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is that if you look at the consequentialist perspective is uh, the consequence is bad for those people, but at the same time, what are the consequences if you do not buy these kind of items? Uh, what would be the consequences, let's say, for the firm that is selling that in terms of employment uh, for your own people, for your country? Uh, what will be the consequences for the people that are using those items? Uh, is Let's say that it's an item that you really need for your work and that is widely used in a lot of fields. Uh, if you uh, deprive people from these items, maybe they will not be able to work. So it's a matter of perspective on which kind of responsibility you have and towards whom this responsibility uh, is, is, is focused. So if you're a cosmopolitan, you would say, okay, I would not, that would be unethical to buy this kind of things. And you have the responsibility to make sure that what you're buying has been built in uh, ethically, uh, yeah, in, in an acceptable uh, situation, acceptable environment. Thank you. Um, let me let me read the another question. It's probably from a student. I think it's a good question. In quote, aiming at good life, why society dictates in quote be a good person seems ambiguous. What is your take on that? Uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is that. Um, I, I would not personally, but that's once again, only a stance that's really subjective. I would not agree on the fact that the society impose anything, right? Uh, you, we are all making choices to conform or not to conform to the society. If you do not agree with the society, you can say, no, obviously this will, this will have consequences that you will accept or not, but this is up to you to make, uh, to make a decision on conform or not conform to the society, the, the role of the society. If you do not agree with a specific uh, role, uh, then you just have to say no. And obviously you will pay the price, right? And that's the difficulty of this kind of decision. Sometimes we do not agree, but we feel like we have no other choice. Uh, actually, technically speaking, we always have choices, right? But this, those choices can lead to either a very bad situation or a really good situation. And sometimes if I, let's say, do not agree with my boss, I can tell him I don't agree with your, your philosophy, I don't agree with your, the politics of, of your firm, but obviously I will lose my job. So I will have to balance the consequences of this decision on me and my family and the people that depend on me uh, with actually my values, right? So this is something that uh, is, is really hard, but the first thing I would say, once again, we all have a responsibility to make our own decision. And we all have to accept the fact that we are human beings and we are to some extent conformist and that we to some extent also have to accept the rules uh, of the world we live in. Thank you. The last question I would say so that you can continue, it comes very likely from Italy, I think by the name, because I'm also Italian, so that's why I can read names. In which way politics affects ethics in the ontology scenario? Um, it depends on, 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 on who you're talking about. Uh, I, I mean, if you talk about how people are influenced by politics, obviously there is a big influence in the special. I would not say that politics influence people. I would say that politics influence people through the media. Uh, most of us are influenced by speeches, narratives that are that have been built by politicians or, or in politics, because there is the media, right? Uh, you need obviously a vehicle to, you know, uh, transport this speech from the politics to uh, the people. So obviously, our ethics is really, really strongly influenced by what we hear, but our interaction with others. So uh, when, you, when you watch TV all the time, when you read the news, uh, and, and when you are really interested in, in political speeches, political stances, obviously you will take them into account in your own appraisal, right? But it will also depend on your personality, your own values. Let's say that you, are, you do not agree with the, uh, the leader of your country, right? You're on the opposite side. 
uh, obviously his influence will be a bit different than if you were on the same side of the leader. But we are all influenced. Once again, we're all influenced. We are not, you know, isolated people. Uh, what we think, the way we built our ethics is based on our interactions with our, our environment. And in a time where the media are really, really strong, really important, obviously politics is a big influencer. Thank you. We, we'll let you continue, Emmanuel. So and we'll take some questions at the end of your part two. Thank okay. you. So let's move to the, uh, the second part uh, about the ethics and artificial intelligence. Uh, AI, as we all know, is, um, I would say, uh, really debated uh, topic. And as I told you, most of the time, it's under the umbrella of cosmetics. And AI is too often assessed through two different perspectives that are, I am in favor of AI, uh, I am against AI, I fear AI, or I really expect uh, AI, I really want to benefit from AI. So AI is, ethically speaking, assessed through the angle of irrational fears, what we call, for example, the Terminator syndrome, uh, feeling that maybe at some point AI will be autonomous enough to make decision by itself, and at some point, maybe AI would decide that human beings are no longer useful, right? And they will just try to destroy humanity. So this is the kind of irrational fear that, that we have. Irrational in the sense that actually we don't know. So um, being scared, scared by this kind of, of, uh, of future does not make sense uh, so far. And at the other, on the other hand, there is this excessive hopes about what AI can bring to uh, humanity. Lots of people are thinking that technology is the solution to uh, lots of our problems, which is obviously not exactly the case. So what I do think is that the debate must be uh, brought back to uh, something in between these irrational fears and excessive hopes. Uh, and just to be rational about what AI is uh, really. Lots of people do not know what AI is. Uh, so uh, there's been this presentation by Professor Zakari yesterday, uh, just introducing us to, to AI. But we, we're not all specialists in AI. So the first question that we have to ask, that's our responsibility when we want to uh, appraise AI through the ethical prism, is to ask ourselves, what is AI? Does it even exist? There is a debate uh, over the fact that maybe AI does not exist, right? Maybe it's a misleading phrase uh, to just try to define algorithms that are working, that are programmed by people. Uh, I've had this debate with lots of people saying that actually AI does not exist because those algorithms are programmed by people. So people are behind that. People are controlling the algorithms, right? But what we've seen yesterday uh, during uh, Professor Zikari's lectures is that you also have the other side, which is those algorithms, and especially in what we call the neural networks, are obviously programmed by people at the very beginning, but at some point, what they do is that they learn from data and they make their decision, own decision. So to what extent? That's another question that we have to ask, and I'm not uh, enough knowledgeable in, 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 in engineering to, to tell you that, but we already know that we are training algorithms to learn by themselves using available uh, di data. So when we talk about AI, the first thing is to know what AI means, what AI is, and obviously our responsibility before making any kind of ethical appraisal is to uh, dig into that, to try to make our opinion, I mean, educated uh, opinion on, on, on what AI is. And then, only then, you can assess uh, AI through the ethical point of view, uh, having taken into account, obviously, what we've seen during the first part. So this is an overview of some of the, of the ethical concerns that you will find um, 
watching news, reading papers. Obviously, it's not exhaustive. You get a lot of them that are missing here in this list. Uh, the first one, and I think the most common one, is <laughs> the threat that AI can represent to humankind, uh, which has been supported by people like Stephen Hawkins, uh, saying that if we do not regulate AI, at some point it will be uh, smarter than human beings, and that at some point maybe, once again, this AI could consider that human being uh, human beings are no longer uh, useful, so you can destroy them, right? So that's the biggest fear that we can have about AI. Uh, then you have a uh, more basic question about privacy and trust. Uh, the fact that we can trust AI, we cannot trust AI. We'll see that through the example of the European Union and the trustworthy AI concept. Uh, but privacy is a big issue, and you know it uh, regarding to the current situation with the COVID. You also have biases and discrimination that have been addressed by Professor Zakaris yesterday, too, right? While programming this AI, even if we ask them to learn by themselves, we provide them with our own biases. So those algorithms at some point will just reproduce the biases of human beings, and that can end in a discriminatory decision uh, on, on, on different things, like let's say uh, recruitment of people for a firm, right? Uh, there can be discrimination. We've seen that uh, already, or, or, or even in the way we will deal with criminality, right? So we know that, for example, in the data that are used by algorithm, there is another representation of, in, in the United States, uh, black Americans. So obviously the algorithm will be built his own decision based on the data he uh, is able to uh, to reach and obviously will discriminate between black and white uh, people in a way that is not morally acceptable. So that's one of the big issues we have. Uh, there can be gender biases also, right? Discrimination between uh, male and female. Then you also have lots of things like uh, predictive policies and what we call the preemption, saying, okay, I will just try to, uh, to make prediction about what will happen in this or that uh, part of the world in terms of, for example, terrorist attack, right? And we will hack preemptively, uh, which is a big question. Can we hack preemptively? Can we really rely on algorithm to tell us that in this part of the world or in this part of my city, the uh, the probability of uh, occurrence of criminal acts would be higher than in another part, and and then just to make decision upon this kind of uh, probabilities. There is a big question of job losses. Uh, may AI replace us in our everyday uh, jobs? So there is a big debate about that. People saying that obviously AI was uh, was uh, lead to uh, loss, strong losses of jobs all around the world and all the saying that it will create new jobs uh, instead. The relation that we have with AI systems was not specific to AI, which is related to technology, our relation to technology, right? And uh, there is a really interesting movie about that, uh, which is called Her, H-E-R, about the relation of man with, uh, uh, with an, an algorithm, right? And uh, so it, it, it's brought to the extreme of the emotional relation, but our relation to AI system is really something uh, concerning. The use of AI in the military, human enhancement, even the question of um, do AI systems deserve to have rights? Let's say uh, you have robots that are fitted with AI uh, systems. Do they have rights? It is something that has been addressed and tackled by the European Union, so it's a really serious question. And the question of control, which is also a very big one, with uh, basically, I would say, two stances, and I will not go deep into that, but I will. Uh, you will have the uh, reference about Andrew Finberg, who is a uh, philosopher of technology, Canadian philosopher of technology, and uh, is just stressing the fact that lots of people consider that we are actually controlling technology, so there is no fear to uh, have about technology and, and AI specifically. And the other stance is to say that technology has its own momentum, that at some point, what you've created at the very beginning 
can change and turn into something that you did not expect, right? So are we controlling technology? That's a big question. Or is technology controlling us? That's also a big debate we can all have, and especially uh, in this time of uh, the overuse of, um, of technology. So regarding all those concerns, um, what we've seen is the development of the idea that we have to develop and use trustworthy AI. We have to trust AI at some point. So this is something that we've been told many, many times. And uh, uh, developers are invited to build trustworthy AI, meaning that if I go back to the, uh, the, the, the last slide, is that you see the picture on the right uh, hand side of the of the slide is that obviously we know what we put into the box of AI, we know what the outcomes are, but we don't know what happens within the box, what, what we call the black box, right? So there is something that is happening within that we do not really understand. So the call is toward uh, developers, programmers, to build something that is trustworthy, being transparent about what is happening in the black box. But for most of us, uh, what is happening in the black box is something that we cannot understand because we do not have the knowledge to understand how algorithms are working, how neural networks are working actually. So even if uh, developers are building this kind of, I mean, transparent and explicable uh, algorithm, we will not be able to understand uh, fully what uh, that means. So when it comes to developing trustworthy AI, the question is what trustworthy AI is. And my first, uh, my first comment would be to say that do we really have to trust AI? Uh, is, is, is that a requirement? Do we have to trust AI? Do we trust other people all the time? Uh, is that the case? Uh, if we have to trust AI, does that mean that AI is uh, autonomous enough to be trustable? That's the question. Uh, if we consider, for example, that AI does not exist, that it's only algorithm uh, acting according to uh, programs, then I would say my, it's, it's pointless to ask if uh, you can trust AI. My question would be, can I trust those people that are programming? the algorithms and can i trust people that are using those algorithms on the contrary if i think that ai had some kind of autonomy already uh obviously i would say okay is ai really uh, trustworthy but you can see that here you will have a big issue with the definition of what trustworthy means and obviously I w I'm, I'm just uh, addressing that to the western perspective but if you go in other countries in other, with other wisdoms, let's say animism, uh, trusting AI would not be a question. If you go to China, trusting AI is not a question at all, right? It's not even a question that, they, that people are asking. So what trustworthy AI mean, we don't know. But based on this idea that we have to build and use trustworthy AI, the point is that we have to set ethical codes uh, that could be applicable either in the whole world or in a specific environment. So this is another debate that we have about ethics and AI is uh, are there codes that can be used widely in the world world? Is it possible to have uh, universal uh, rules that can be applicable to AI or are those rules really specific to a, specific, uh, to, to, to a country, to a community? or a specific situation. Uh, so for people that do have this um, cosmopolitan perspective on the world, obviously I would say that there are universal values on which you can build uh, universal uh, ethical codes. Uh, and if you do not uh, agree with that, you will say codes must be developed and focused on a specific case, specific uh, context. Uh, there has been a study by the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research uh, in late 2018. Uh, you will also have the, the reference for that, that 
just identified 18 strategies about AI that have been published so far. The author is Tim Dutton. And um, what is, is showing in his, uh, in his paper, which is really interesting, is that when it comes to uh, AI strategy, first of all, all countries are not really interested in ethics. All countries are not taking into account ethical consideration, I mean, in specifically the AI strategy. If you look, for example, at the strategy, the German strategy, the Japanese strategy, uh, the South Korean strategy, there is no mention of ethics within the, um, the strategy, right? Uh, if you look at other strategies, like the French strategy or the Canadian strategy, then you will see that ethics is taken into account. So that first shows that when it comes to AI, all countries do not have the same interest in the ethical uh, consideration about AI. It doesn't mean that uh, Germany or Japan or South Korea are, are not interested in ethics. That just means that maybe the perception of the benefits of AI uh, through the ethical prism is not the same as for other countries. And the other thing that has been stressed by Tim Dutton in his uh, paper is that uh, there are obviously values or ethical standards that are common to some of the strategies, but there is no common value to all the strategies. Each strategy that is dealing with ethics is really specific, is really unique. Okay, you, can, you cannot find any kind of ethical stance that would be adopted in all the strategies that have been uh, studied by, by Tim Dutton. So, which is really interesting, I think. So can we think about a universal uh, ethical standards? That's a big question. Uh, if yes, we would be uh, responsible of setting it up. Uh, can we even implement this kind of universal ethical standards? It seems that we cannot. It seems that it's really uh, impossible to, uh, to do so. so. But the debate is here, and there is no clear answer to that question. And there is a, another study that I would talk to you about, I'll tell you about a bit later, that actually shows that the trend is much more toward specific codes of conduct regarding the use and the development of AI than something that would be universal. Nonetheless, uh, this idea of building a trust for AI, once again, is much more about cosmetics than it is about ethics. It's really a theoretical stance that would be really tough to put into practice, right? Uh, obviously, if you, if you uh, develop a standards in terms of um, the ethical use and development of AI, you will have to also have the tools in order to make sure that those standards are correctly implemented. It means money, it means people, it means a really strong political will. Uh, it means a lot of things that are really difficult to gather. So between the theory and the practice, there is a strong gap that we have to uh, think about. If we look at, uh, <coughs> sorry, trust for CAI, I think that the best example of that is the uh, European Union. Uh, which tried to uh, develop this idea of, of trust for CAI in its uh, strategy that has been issued in 2020. Um, what the European Union is, is uh, stating is that if we want to build trust for CAI, we have to make sure that the AI that we're developing, that we're using, will respect what we call the uh, fundamental rights of citizens of Europe. So. The first thing I think we have to do when you have to, um, uh, to evaluate that through the ethical angle is just to go back to the fundamental rights of the European Union and the charter that has been issued in 2012. And if you look at this slide, uh, you can see some of the, uh, of the standards that are, that are uh, expressed in this charter. Uh, everyone has the right to the protection of personal data, for example, regarding AI that's really uh, really important. Uh, so personal data concerning him or her and data must be processed fairly for specified purposes and in compliance with these rules uh, shall be subject to control by independent authority. So this is the theory. 
uh, in the practice, it's much more complex to, uh, uh, to implement. Uh, if you have a look at this charter, you will see that what we call the fundamental rights are uh, mainly dignity, freedoms, under which falls the uh, data protection, equality, solidarity, citizens' rights, and justice. So these are all words. And this is all theory because all those words, when I tell them to you, obviously you feel like, oh, that's great. We're trying to respect all those really valuable uh, rights. But the point is that all those rights are ill-defined and they're even not defined at all for some of them, right? So talking about dignity is really great. We all think that, okay, uh, we have to respect human dignity. That's great. But when it comes to say, okay, how can we implement that? How will we define what human dignity is? It's much more complex than we think. When it comes to freedoms, okay, what is exactly freedoms? How can we develop freedom? How can we implement rules that will make sure that we will respect freedom? And are those rights even applicable only to uh, European citizens or do we have to apply them to other people all around the world through the cosmopolitan approach? So the big problem is that all this trustworthy AI concept that has been built by the European Union has been built on, I would say, uh, sand. It's really, you know, loose ground. And when you build a building on loose ground, obviously the full building will be unstable. So the trustworthy AI strategy developed by the European Union is based on really loose grounds about what are fundamental rights and what is ethics. So it obviously uh, leads us to, to question the very legitimacy of, of, this, of this specific stance. Then, uh, we can have a look at the white paper that has been issued uh, this year in February uh, about the development of, of uh, artificial intelligence. And what you can see is, first, the grounds of the trustworthy AI are not clearly defined and are not stable and not really reliable. And then what you see reading the white paper and many other papers that have been uh, issued by the European Union is that actually it seems that the European Union is not able to make a decision between two things that are really important. On the one hand, the protection of fundamental rights, uh, what they call the human-centered approach and trying just to uh, protect people from harms that can... Uh, uh, that can be done by, by the use or development of AI. And on the other hand, the potential benefits of AI, and, and especially in terms of innovation, as you can see on the second point here, uh, the European Union is aiming at becoming the global leader in innovation in the data economy. So the point is that, is there, how can you say that you will protect um, uh, personal data on the one hand and say, okay, we'll just make sure that people, uh, data will not be used uh, in, in a way that is not acceptable. And on the other way, say that you want to be the leader in the data economy, meaning that you will need data, right? So that's the kind of tension the European Union is trying to deal with. There are strong economic stakes, financial stakes. There are stakes in terms of jobs that can be created by AI and by the data industry, the data economy. And there, on the other end, uh, there are consequences for fundamental rights. So it's, it's mainly a matter of hierarchy of what you think is most valuable. Do you really want to have a strong economy based on data or, or, or AI? and then create jobs and uh, improve, obviously, the, uh, the well-being of, of your people, or do you want to protect data? So once again, the choice is not between those two extremes. There are in between solutions. But at some point, we will have to make a choice. The European Union is uh, to make a choice. But it's really hard to implement the respect for fundamental rights when, at the same time, 
you are seeking to get the more uh, uh, benefits from the, uh, the development of AI, the economy of uh, AI. So what the European Union is, is trying to do is to use this idea of trust. Uh, we have to build, it's written in the, uh, the white paper, we have to build an ecosystem of trust, uh, trust. And building the ecosystem of trust is, can, can be seen in different ways. You can see, okay, the intention is really good and the European Union is trying to really develop AI that, be, uh, that can be uh, uh, trusted and that, that is trustworthy. Or you can say, this is only a speech, a discourse narrative, just to, uh, let's say, make people, you know, uh, be uh, less concerned about the development of AI. Uh, in other words, maybe it's only cosmetics. So it depends on your reading of that. But if you uh, if you go on reading all those documents and you, for example, read the uh, read the data strategy that has been also issued uh, early this year, uh, you will see that the focus is really on what we can gain from the development of AI. This must be put into a global context, global environment. We'll go back to that. But it's not only the European Union, it's also the interest of each state that is member of the European Union. Obviously, France has a strong interest in developing AI, right? Uh, Germany has a strong interest in developing AI. And I guess that Spain maybe has less interest in doing so. There is interest, but each country will obviously evaluate its own interest in developing AI and what it can gain uh, from the development of AI in terms of job, of research and development, education, all that things, and put it in the balance to see if it's worth going, uh, moving, for, uh, moving forward to, toward uh, more AI or if it's more important to uh, protect human value. So this, this, there is this debate within the European Union, but there is also this debate within the international uh, uh, scene uh, where if the European Union would say, let's say, from a deontological stance, okay, we won't violate human rights, so we will just frame the use and the development of AI. What would be the implication at the international level, uh, knowing that, for example, China does not have this kind of constraint, that China is not taking human rights uh, the same way that Europeans are doing, that they do not even have the same perspective on uh, human rights. Uh, what about the US developing uh, its own AI uh, for economic purposes? Uh, what would be the, the stance, what would be the consequences for the people here in Europe if AI is developed in other countries and not, not in the European Union? That would definitely lead to uh, job losses. That would have really heavy consequences. So are we sure that protecting fundamental human rights would lead to the greatest happiness, to the greatest number? So that's a big question that we have to answer if we want to make a decision. Or do we just adopt the, uh, the ontological stance saying, okay, whatever the consequences, we must not violate uh, fundamental rights. But when you look at the stakes, the number, the figure that you have on the, uh, on the slide here, you understand that it's not all about fundamental rights, far from it. Uh, one of the best examples of that is uh, lethal autonomous uh, weapons, the development of these military systems that are fitted with AI. Uh, and once again, there is this big tension between political, political interests and philosophical uh, consideration. What we've seen so far is when it comes to lethal autonomous weapons systems, what we call laws, is much more about politics than about philosophy. Uh, obviously, lots of people are asking an uh, uh, interesting question about the ethicality of the use of, you know, killing uh, robots, uh, let's say drones that are delivering harms to kill people, make their own decision. We are moving toward that. Uh, that's, that's something obvious. We don't know when it will be uh, available in the market, but we are definitely moving toward this idea of uh, robotic systems that will be able to identify targets and they to treat those targets uh, whenever they went without any uh, human control. 
So there are lots of people like the campaign to stop killer robots that are working to uh, just bring the international community to the table and find a framework, uh, a frame, a legal frame to, uh, to make sure that um, this system will not be used uh, uh, in, in a way that would not be uh, ethically acceptable. But once again, there are really lots of things that are at stakes here. It's not only about human rights, it's not only about ethics, it's not only about uh, legal consideration, it's also about money. If you only look at military robotics, what we've seen is an increase of 3.2 billion US dollar per year with, uh, in, in, two, in 2014. And, and, and there will be 10.2 billion more in, 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 in 2021, right? So no one wants to go without this kind of uh, benefits. Plus, you have to take into account that when we're developing these kind of systems, uh, we can say, okay, it's not ethical to have people that are killed by autonomous systems for this or that reason. But at the same time, what we know is that research and development in the autonomy of drones can also be used in the civilian world. It's what we call dual technologies that, uh, that can be used in many, many fields that can have countless applications, right? So if you say at some point we have to stop developing those systems, those autonomous systems, what would be the consequences for research and development? What would be the consequences for civilian applications? What would be the consequences for, let's say, tech companies? What would be the consequences for economies such as the United States or such as the, uh, the Chinese one? So it's not only about your ethical, ethical stance about it is acceptable or it's not. It's all about political consideration, which are way wider than just the ethical uh, perspective on that. Uh, some figures, uh, but I, don't, I won't go too deep into that. Uh, about the uh, arms sales, uh, when you're developing this kind of, of systems, autonomous systems, obviously you think about selling them to other countries that do not have uh, the means to, uh, to, to work on autonomy, on, on AI, et cetera, right? And when you look at the market here, you can see that obviously there are some countries like Russia, France, Germany, China, and the US that are really uh, big actors and, and, and selling arms is really important. You can be against that, saying that it's unethical because those arms will be used to kill people, kill innocent victims, that's a stance. But the other stance would be, okay, look at France, Germany, China, US, that represents 75% of arm exports. What would that mean for those countries to just go without the development of autonomous lethal weapons? What if France says, okay, we don't want to do that um, and we don't want to go that way because we think that it will violate some uh, universal rights? What would happen is that obviously the other actors will just share the, the cake. They will just use the US, the uh, Russian uh, uh, and China and Germany would definitely do the job for France. So in France, we would lose, uh, would lose jobs would have uh, some consequences on research and development, education, and all the, uh, uh, the activities that are revolving around uh, autonomous systems, while on the other hand, other countries will just develop their own industry, right? Uh, so, I mean, neither one or the other of the, those countries that are mentioned here uh, want that. We want to benefit from the development of those systems. And so in terms of consequences, Obviously, you have to think about the whole consequences of stopping the development of autonomous weapons or going on with the development of those systems. Then you also have to put that into a bigger context, right? When you are making this kind of uh, ethical appraisal of this or that situation regarding AI, it's not only about you or me. Uh, saying that it is ethically acceptable or it's not ethically acceptable. Uh, we have to put that into a bigger context that for most of us, uh, we are not really mastering. We do not really understand all the stakes. We don't know about all the stakes that, uh, that are uh, involved in this kind of, of, of questioning AI uh, ethics. 
what we see, what we know is that if you look at the international level, there, e there is a strong competition between uh, actors, uh, can be public or private actors. As we've seen for lethal autonomous weapons, what you will not do uh, because you, are, you will head up the ontological stance will be done by others. So uh, you have to think about the consequences of that. And obviously, um, and especially in those times of recession, then we are just all concerned about the after of the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, lots of economies all, all around the world are, are suffering from, um, from the confinement and the closing of uh, the industries and, 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 and the economy. Uh, I think after that, we will have to make sure that we will rebuild our economies. And uh, if there is a way to do so through the development and uh, the use of AI, then I think that we will all do that. So the ethical consideration about fundamental uh, human rights will be suddenly put aside or will be lower in the hierarchy of the consideration taken into account by, the, uh, by government. So there is this strong competition that is uh, going on at the international level, which um, influence obviously the uh, the decision we make uh, about what is right and what is wrong. And plus, if we take the international level, we've discussed that earlier, uh, that would be really hard to set ethical standards that would be respected by all countries. So far, there is no standards, may be legal or ethical, that has been applied by every country's uh, in the world, uh, you certainly uh, know about the nuclear uh, weapons ban, which has not been signed by all countries. You can talk about the International Criminal Court, and you can see that uh, state interests are really important when it comes to make this kind of ethical decision about the development of uh, these or that standards. In the world, uh, there is a study that has been done by uh, PwCs about uh, the, uh, the benefits of, uh, of AI. And what you can see here on the slide is that if you look at China, the total impact of the development of AI uh, would be a growth of 26.1% of its uh, gross domestic product. So obviously, you can go to China and tell them, OK, look, it's not really ethical to use data in order to feed your algorithm in order to develop your AI. Obviously, you can say that. That would be a deontological point of view. But the Chinese government would tell you, uh, OK, great. But look at what would happen if I go without those 26 person growth uh, of my domestic product. What would be the implication for my people? Okay, and, and, and then China would tell you, uh, do you really think it's relevant to, uh, to apply ethical standards? The funny thing is that if you look at the uh, Chinese strategy, they are presenting ethical standards. But the point is, that to, is, is to consider that those ethical standards are mainly done in order to reassure people that they are doing good things when they sell things outside of China much more than a really, I mean, uh, a strong conviction about, about the importance of ethics. So it's just a way to sell product, saying, OK, we are following ethical standards. But if you go on the other side, uh, if you go to North America, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that neither the US nor Canada would uh, definitely go without this 14.5% 40, of growth in their domestic product just for ethical consideration, right? So when you look at what is at stake, obviously you can see that ethical consideration can be either high or low in the list of, of consideration. So that brings us to um, the kind of last points. I will go uh, over that quite quickly, but lots of people would say that in terms of AI, um, states do not have any kind of, you know, ethical point of view. They are really unethical in the way they, they see AI. I just want to stress here that saying that something is ethical does not really make sense. 
wrong things in the ethical as well as bad things. Uh, since ethics is just the appraisal of what is wrong and what is right, right? So you can say that something is ethically acceptable or ethically unacceptable, but we cannot technically see, say that um, a specific action is not ethical. That does not really make sense. So lots of people would say that states are unethical in the sense that they do not respect, you know, ethical standards like uh, respecting fundamental rights. Uh, but it can be seen also in another way, saying that states have responsibilities toward their own citizens, toward their own people. And if in order to make sure that the people will have uh, acceptable standard of living, they have to develop AI, whatever it costs, they will do so. And uh, as well for the European Union, uh, you can say, I won't do that for this or that reason, respecting values, respecting the ontological stance, but at the same time, what you will do is that you will lose big part of this market and of the benefits that goes with it. Uh, you certainly know this uh, statement by uh, President Vladimir Putin in September 2017, saying that artificial intelligence is the future, and whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. Uh, there's lots of things that have been said about this statement by Vladimir Putin, especially because it comes from Russia. But um, if you look at other countries, China has clearly also stated that it wanted to be the world leader in AI uh, by uh, 2030, if you look at the new generation of AI plan. The same thing with the European Union. I told you that earlier. France has also uh, clearly established by that it wanted to be a leader in AI, Canada as well, and even the uh, United Arab Emirates. And following that, if you look at the AI Global Index, you will see that 56 countries are uh, currently competing, competing for AI, right? So when you think about the ethical implication of AI, you have to take that into account. Once again, it's a big market. So you either adopt uh, the ontological stance saying, I will not do this kind of things because it goes against my values. Or you say, I'm a consequentialist. And what I see is that if I don't do that, there will be heavy consequences for my people, uh, for the region, if you take the, the European Union. So it's just a choice that you have to make between the two different stances. Same thing about, obviously, private actors. Uh, it, it's almost impossible to make a difference between private and public. Uh, you have all are heard about the GAFAM and the BATEX, and, uh, and we all know that uh, companies, tech companies like uh, Google, Apple, Alibaba, etc., they do have strong connections with government, right? Uh, so it's really hard to make a difference between the two of them. But once again, this kind of, of companies, uh, you can say that they are unethical. That would be a stance, but you can also say that they are working for the country. They are creating jobs, right? And they are trying to compete within a, a, a very tough environment like any kind of other company. Uh, so making a stance or making an appraisal of the uh, ethicality of uh, the action of the big data industry is really tough if you do not take into account uh, the big picture. Can we go with all that taken into account? Can we go toward something that would be uh, AI global governance? Uh, I've told you through the work of Tim Dutton that it's not really what um, uh, we're seeing right now. There's been a really, really interesting, and I would definitely recommend that you read it, uh, study made by Anna Jobin and other uh, researchers about the global landscape of ethics guidelines. Uh, what they've done actually is that they've identified uh, 3,400 codes uh, in the world, 3,400. Um, within those 3,400 codes, they've, uh, they've identified a little bit more than uh, 1,100 of them that were pertaining with ethical principles, okay? So, I mean, the 3,400 codes were about AI, and among which 
a bit more than uh, 1,100 of them were pertaining with ethical principles. Then, uh, for uh, for technical reason, they've just made a selection between those codes. So 1,100 codes is is already something big, right? They, they've taken 84 of them uh, based on the language they were written in, because obviously the researcher were not able to read all the languages. Uh, by which institutional entities they were uh, uh, they were issued, and all the factors that can take into account. At the very end, they've selected 84 codes of ethics regarding AI. They've studied them thoroughly, and you can read the study uh, online. You will have the uh, the link at the end of the PowerPoint. What they found is really interesting. They found they identified 11 overarching ethical values and principles, 11 of them. Uh, namely, transparency, uh, justice and fairness, non-maleficence, responsibility, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Basic values, ethical values and principles, 11 of them, right? But the interesting point is that studying those 84 codes pertaining with ethical principle, they found that no single ethical principle appeared in all of them. Some codes do share a uh, principle, but there is no value that is common to all those codes. So what does that mean? That means that if it, when it comes to um, trying to set a global governance, that's almost impossible. And I would even say that's impossible uh, because you will have different stances, you will have different importances, importance given to uh, this or that ethical standard. So what's the aim of ethical codes? Uh, some people would say, okay, just once again, the cosmetics, just to reassure people, to make um, action legitimate when it is not really legitimate. For some other, that would be a way to frame the development and the use of AI in a specific context, specific situation, but you obviously have to put that into the big picture. And what is the relevance of ethical codes? Uh, that's a big question. I don't have the answer for that. It depends on your stance on, um, on, on the way those codes are, are set. Uh, but you can either say, okay, it's better than nothing, or you can say also that once again, just a communication tool, a marketing tool, let's say. Last point, really fast, because I only have uh, 10 minutes, I'm sorry for that. There is a big question about the tracking apps uh, that is developed for COVID-19. And the question is, obviously, is it ethically acceptable to use such an app to fight the coronavirus? So there is no clear answer to that. Uh, obviously, the once again, you have to put that into a bigger context. Uh, this app is, is cur currently under debate in France, for example. And uh, I think in two or three days, there will be a big debate at the, parliament, the French parliament about uh, the relevance of the development of this kind of application. And the question is, is, is that ethically acceptable? What would be the consequences uh, for our uh, privacy for, for in, in terms of the use of, of data? Uh, the French government is explaining us that uh, actually this uh, application will not use big data. It will be based on Bluetooth system, right? So in doing so, what they're doing is that they are following the European Union, uh, yeah, yeah, the European Union uh, stance uh, about making the app as transparent and explicable as possible. But for most of us, saying that it will use Bluetooth is pointless. Uh, personally, I don't know what that means. I don't know exactly if we can, you know, track people after that. Uh, I don't know what that, what technically it, it, it really uh, means to use only a Bluetooth. So yes, it's transparent. Yes, it's explicable. But for people like me, for laymen, I mean, it doesn't make really sense. I don't know. And the bigger context is also the use, the overuse of uh, tracking apps by countries such as China. Uh, where you've suddenly heard about the social credit uh, system that has been developed that is uh, tracking all the people and, and just giving them uh, marks 
And depending on the mark that you have, you will be uh, allowed to access to uh, public transportation, schools, uh, administration, or even get a credit in your bank, uh, these kind of things. So uh, it's, it's really tracking people, just controlling people. So the risk is with this kind of uh, COVID-19 tracking apps to fall into a society of control. Uh, so there is this fear. And for, once again, most of us, uh, I don't mean only in France, but here in Canada, in the United States, in other countries, in the European Union, in Africa, or wherever you live, uh, the technicality of all this is totally pointless because we have no knowledge to be able to assess correctly the risks and benefits of such an app. If you're a deontologist, you would say you don't have to get into that way just because the risks are too high and that will violate the fundamental rights in terms of privacy for example if you're a consequentialist you would say okay but look if we use this time this kind of apps maybe we can save lives uh, so that's worth being done so that would be ethically acceptable even if and that dirty hand principle even if using these apps to save people would mean that at some point we will have to violate some fundamental rights such as liberty or, or, or privacy. So once again, there is no clear, uh, I mean, solution to this, to this great debate, great uh, question, but it is our responsibility, back to this really strong concept, our responsibility to make our own opinion and then to try to have an impact on the uh, in the political decisions that are made. I think this is something that we'll uh, dig a little bit for the next, uh, next lecture on, on values and humankind and all these things. But basically, this is what I could say uh, about that. Uh, my conclusion is as following. Uh, obviously, it's always about making a decision saying yes or saying no and accepting the consequences of such decision. This is all about ethics and AI. Uh, but uh, my advice here would be to think about it uh, twice, just try to see, uh, to see the bigger picture and do not focus on your own values, interest and, and perspective. And at the very end of the day, the, the interesting thing is that by developing AI and by thinking about the, um, the ethicality of AI, we are we are actually discovering the complexity of our own ethical uh, reflection of, of the complexity of our uh, own, you know, uh, brain functioning because we're trying actually to duplicate uh, human brains in uh, in technology by AI, and and all the concerns that are raised by the uh, development and use of AI are actually concerns that we already have when it comes to assess uh, our own behaviors. And I will end there and I will uh, obviously thank you for your attention. And if you have one or two questions, I would be really happy to answer them. Thank you, Manuel. That was uh, the second part was the a major contrast to the first one. So that's really quite amazing. Um, I will make this suggestion because you know, we have so many questions in the chat if I save the chat, then I can send it to you and possibly you can pick up some of the questions for your, you know, you're doing another lecture here mm -hmm. and then you can probably have time also to reflect on some of the questions. So maybe that would be the solution. I'd like to maybe give you one question, just, you know, uh, obviously on, on the COVID app, there's a lot of discussion, but maybe you can have a look at the questions there. There's one interesting question that's come from uh, a colleague um, in, in the legal space that said, um, an excellent point to further elaborate would be, is ethical AI compatible with the existing legal rules for a legal given order? So how does it re relate ethics, ethics AI and law? Maybe, uh, and, and you have, uh, we have five minutes till the end of the session. Okay, uh, just to answer that uh, pretty quickly, there is a strong relation between ethics and, and laws. Obviously, most of the time laws is based on ethics, but it's, these are different different things. 
Uh, my my point on that would be to say that ethics is here to you know uh, fill the gap between uh, between the legal consideration and the uh, uh, and and the uh, the decision that are made by 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 states regarding AI. What I mean is that actually the legal framework is definitely insufficient to frame correctly AI. And if you want to uh, create new rules, you will have to put everybody around the table and to find compromises. And that's really something almost impossible when so much is at stake. Uh, we've talked about the laws, the uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems. There have been discussion for years uh, about the kind of legal uh, frame that we have to set in order to limit the use of these systems. What we've seen so far is that the economical state power state are so high that there is no way to find a compromise. So instead of wasting time trying to elaborate a legal framework for this, uh, for, uh, for AI, what we're doing is that we are using ethics, which is much more flexible, right? You don't have to write anything. You don't have to agree on a document. You don't have to elaborate a, uh, a law or something like that. You just have to, uh, to, to express your stance and maybe you will find people that will agree with you and people that will not. So ethics is mainly used in order to fill this void of legal framework. Uh, that is applicable to AI. And because it's flexible, because lots of people do not know what ethics means, because lots of the words that are used are ill defined or not defined, it makes it really flexible. So you can say something, do something different, and then legitimate by using the definition that you want of the uh, initial uh, ethical stance. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you very much for the very interesting uh, lecture. I, I wish we have another hour to answer all the questions. So as I say, I'll, I'll try to save the chat so that you can have a look at uh, some of the uh, questions that have been raised and also comments because the only, there was a very interesting set of information being given on projects and, and information related to some of the slides you presented. I would like to thank you very much for taking time. I'd like to thank all the participants that um, listened and contributed to the chat. And um, Emmanuel will be also teaching another time. Uh, you will have it in the schedule. And uh, thank you again. And um, we'll send you the invitation for next week where we'll have uh, two sets of lectures as well. And to everybody, Thank you, stay safe, and making sure that uh, for students, you look at your file, the toddler should have sent it to you, and for all the other people, I wish you will be able to have a good day, and I'll probably see you for the next lecture. Bye then. Thank you to you all, bye. Thank you.